Once you start studying the Borden murder case, you will quickly find that authors present information that cannot be supported with any actual evidence. Much like the trial itself, without evidence of guilt, it is difficult, if not impossible, to secure a conviction. One of my pet peeves is the abundance of myths that have developed concerning the major characters in the story. This episode is the first in a series of examinations into character and proof of historical fact. I call this endeavor Myth-Busting the Borden Case, after the popular Mythbusters series on the Discovery Channel that tested out perceived truths to determine fact from fiction. First up, Andrew Jackson Borden. Let's Mythbust him, shall we? Myth. Andrew Borden was a skinflint. This myth is based on rumors, gossip, and innuendo. Authors have invented character traits that stick with the Andrew is a skinflint myth. One of the myths is that Andrew raised the rent on tenants when their pay increased. There's no evidence of this at all. Another myth is that Andrew cut off the legs of dead people to fit them into his short coffins. Again, not true. As a matter of fact, while Andrew was an undertaker, in 1890s, an undertaker was someone who undertook the business, the business of undertaking, meaning he rented out the camp chairs He rented out the carriages that would take the people to the cemetery. Perhaps they would buy a casket from him that he had made or ordered for them. But he didn't deal with the bodies. That was for a mortician. Another myth based on rumor is that Andrew didn't get electricity in his house and made everyone use kerosene. Well, the reason why Andrew didn't get electricity in his house was because that electricity was not widely available in the time era that he lived at 92 Second Street. Let me read to you from Parallel Lives, A Social History of Lizzie A. Borden and Her Fall River by the Fall River Historical Society. A look at the introduction and expansion of electric lighting in Fall River is beneficial to an understanding of the utility options available and which were more widely used. The Fall River Electric Light Company and the Edison Electric Illuminating Company of Fall River were both established in 1883, primarily as a supply for street lighting. As the companies expanded, electricity was not restricted to street lighting, but was also available to stores equipped with appropriate fixtures and located in circuited areas. By 1890, The acquisition of additional equipment was necessitated in order to satisfy the city's growing demands. Two more alternating current machines were installed in sections of Fall River, but not until 1894 and 1895. Only a cherished few enjoyed the benefits of electricity in the final days of the 19th century in that Massachusetts mill city. Available at a premium price, $15 per kilowatt hour in 1892, It is understandable why, three years later, there were still only 45 electrical meters in a city with a population of 89,203. Gas lighting was more widely used, but was still quite expensive, as evidenced by the fact that the city extinguished the gas lights in the hours before dawn in order to minimize costs but many residential customers still favored fluid lamps over piped gas, which was invisible, did not possess the manufactured scent, which it does today, and was considered dangerously explosive by some. Kerosene also was by far the most reasonably priced, allowing for its longevity as a popular favorite. In this respect, it would seem that Borden was only one among many who remained satisfied with the practical lighting source. I have to say as an aside, and maybe I shouldn't, but I will anyway, I took a tour of the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast, and my tour guide, Jack, 
informed me that old man Borden was so miserly and was such a skinflint that he made his daughters pay for the kerosene that they used when he could have had electricity because it was widely used in the city at the time. Let's look at the evidence as to the opposite of this myth. The evidence as to Andrew Borden's generosity. Evidence. In 1864, 1865, Andrew moved to 11 Ferry Street, a two-family home with no tenants or renters, after the death of his first wife and before his marriage to Abby Durfee Gray in June of 1865. Before his marriage, he had a housekeeper, Sarah's first cousin, Elizabeth Morse, and a servant, one Sarah Welch. At the time of the move, Emma was 13 and Lizzie was four years old. He had purchased the home from his father in 1854. It was across the street from number 13 Ferry Street, the Borden Homestead. Evidence. Andrew paid for Emma to attend Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts from April 1867 until July 1868, four semesters in all, starting when she was but 16 years old, this included room, board, classes, and extras. He paid a total of $386.25, not counting Emma's pen money or extra purchases like supplies and textbooks. In today's money, this amounts to $7,732.73. Evidence. Between 1871 and 1875, Andrew bought and sold land in Swansea, Massachusetts, including the property that was to become the Borden Almy Summer Home. It was to this home, located on Gardner Neck Road, that the Borden family traveled to escape the summer heat of Fall River. The property extended from the street to the Coal River. Evidence In 1872, Andrew purchased number 66 Second Street later renumbered to number 92, and 30 rods of land on the east side of the house for $10,000. It had previously been a two-family home. He converted it to single use and added central heating, installing steam heat instead of the use of fireplaces. He also hired a servant, listed in the 1880 census as Mary Green. At the time of the move, Emma was 21 and Lizzie was 12 years old. Evidence. In 1874, as soon as it was available, Andrew connected to the city water, installing two faucets, one in the kitchen and one in the barn. He paid $7.50 per year for this service. There was a water closet with a flushing mechanism located in the cellar. Evidence. Lizzie and Emma Borden though unmarried and of working age, never had to seek employment in their entire lives. Andrew gifted each daughter with an allowance of some $200 per year. In today's money, that equals approximately $6,500. The average salary for a teacher in 1890 was $256 a year. Evidence. Andrew paid for Lizzie and Emma to each have a wardrobe made for them twice a year. Evidence. Andrew paid for Lizzie to go on a 19-week grand tour of Europe in 1890. The cost would have been between $750 and $800. This is equal to $24,400 in today's money. Evidence. In 1887, Andrew gave his daughters the Borden Homestead, number 13 Ferry Street, for them to make an income from. On July 15, 1892, two weeks before the murders, Andrew bought it back from Lizzie and Emma for $5,000. In today's money, this amounts to $162,789. So why the myth? Perhaps it's an exercise in demonizing the victim. If Lizzie got away with murder, and we like her, then her father must have been evil or deserving of his fate, 
in some way. Evidence. It's the most important thing for you to look for in your study of the case. You need to prove it one way or the other to yourself. I hope you're enjoying these episodes of Mondo Lizzie Borden and find them informative and helpful. For 10 years, I published The Hatchet, a journal of Lizzie Borden and Victorian studies. All of the articles are online now for you to see. If you go to lizzieandrewborden.com and click on The Hatchet, you'll be directed to all of the researched articles on the study of the case that have been published for 10 years in our magazine. This is a great place to go to find vetted, factual, accurate, historical information about all kinds of topics relating to the Borden murders of 1892. Also, take a visit to Mondo Lizzie Borden. Again, the link is through lizzieandrewborden.com. It is my blog that I've had for a number of years, and on it I discuss history, facts, clues, reviews, and news related to the boarding case. Enjoy. Until next time.